Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journey, our discussions, our discoveries, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2022. And specifically, I'd like to focus on a film which might be found in this wonderful box set release from Criterion earlier this year in 2022. This box set being Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Project Number no. 4. As we know, there are a number of films included in such set. One of such films being a work which is described as being from the year 1939. And it is uh, designated by Criterion at spy number 1144. This is a work from the filmmaker Mario Sofici. And the name of the work is Prisioneros de la Tierra. from the year 1939 and it is from the filmmaker Mario Sofici and it is based upon a number of works, a number of writings uh, by uh, Horacio Quiroga and uh, the adaptation uh, for purposes of the screenplay was made by Dario Quiroga and Ulisse Petit de Morat and among its wonderful cast we have people like Francisco Petrone, uh, Angel uh, Magana, uh, Raul de Lange, uh, Elisa Galve and others. Uh, this is the work and please pardon me once again for my very poor pronunciation but I'm doing my very best uh, from 1939, uh, Prisioneros de la Tierra or as it might be translated into English, Prisoners of the Earth. And my goodness, there is so much that um, can be said about this work uh, in terms of the restoration process, another miracle of restoration as we see it described in some of the materials, the written materials for purposes of the set, as well as the supplemental materials that accompany it that are tied to this specific film, this Sofici work, uh, Prisioneros de la Tierra, uh, which we'll get to a little bit later in this uh, video discussion. But before we do, uh, let us focus in on uh, the story or plot structure of this film. Uh, this is purported to be taking place during uh, the uh, beginning uh, years of the 20th century or around circa 1915. And we have this, uh, this uh, idea or the uh, setting, uh, Missionis Area. And this is the setting or landscape or environment upon which this film's story takes place in terms of the plantation, the industrial drive uh, plantation uh, regarding the cultivation of specific plants or leaves for purposes of this uh, market. And uh, the story then uh, focuses in on a number of characters uh, that are portrayed by our uh, uh, our main actors here. So the the uh, the plantation owner, uh, who has a type of, of say uh, uh, a will and drive that might be said to be uh, somewhat villainous and authoritarian in terms of how he treats his workers uh, that are working on the plantation here, the mensu, and uh, how their plight and how their uh, their dire circumstances are uh, really quite fragmented and actually quite, uh, quite uh, compellingly uh, and exponentially increased uh, in a very tragic and quite, uh, quite, uh, um, uh, quite terrifying way in a number of places. And so this is represented, of course, by uh, the positioning of this uh, character, the plantation owner. Uh, this is the Francisco Petrone character. Kulner. And of course, on the other side of this coin, we have the plight of the mensu, these uh, contract workers who are working on the farms, the plantations. One such character, one such mensu we focus in on this film is the uh, Ayamagana character. This is uh, Podle. And we see him and his plight and his struggles and his, uh, together with the community of the mensu that he and we as viewers uh, come to know and become associated with as the film progresses, our sympathy these, of course, uh, belong to them maybe as a type of natural progression, but also in terms of a plot or story structure that is uh, focusing in on characters, because we understand that uh, this other main character, this Mensu character, Podle character, 
uh, has certain concerns about uh, injustice and uh, a, a sort of uh, a hopes for uh, maybe revolutionary spirit and liberation in the face of uh, these very dip very difficult and quite, in many ways, uh, inhumane uh, circumstances that are imposed by the plantation uh, dynamics uh, as personified by uh, the plantation owner himself. But also we understand that there is a personal side or an emotional side to the story, uh, namely that with the, uh, the relationship that is developed in terms of the doctor, uh, this is the, uh, the Raul de uh, Lange character, and the doctor's daughter, uh, Andrea, or Chinita, and this is uh, Elisa Galvez's character as well. And here we have the formation of what one might call a love uh, triangle, or perhaps uh, if one uh, considers the role of the father as well, because the relationship between the father and daughter is a very significant one, an important one, and critical one, when one considers the way in which the drama, and indeed the melodrama, unfolds uh, at a, quite a a, a, a quite a compelling pace. We understand that there are a number of characters, maybe a triangle or quadrangle, a quadrangle or or a, a, a three or four or more characters. Uh, so we have the Mensu character, uh, Podle, and then we have the plantation owner character, Colner, and then we have the doctor character, and then we have uh, uh, the Lisa Galve character. And so, uh, based on their relationships with uh, this young woman, uh, we see various aspects of the plot play itself out again in forms of drama and indeed in forms of a type of of, uh, of uh, a wonderful soap opera uh, type of melodrama. And that's one of the great strengths of this film, and we'll get to that momentarily, is the way in which it seems to envelop at the same time various modes and tones and styles to great effect, one of which being the melodrama aspect as personified by uh, these various triangles that emerge, uh, jealousy, love, betrayal, and passion and innocence, and indeed the relationship between this young woman and the men's who work her, how this is affected by how the plantation owner feels about the young woman, etc. How does the doctor, uh, the father, the doctor figure into this? And what is the relationship? And how is the relationship between uh, father and daughter? How does this at all impact the way in which uh, her a potential future, uh, if any, with either of these uh, potential suitors uh, in her life. Uh, how will this be impacted either for the better or for maybe for the worse, depending on how uh, the situation between her and her father plays itself out. So it's, it, it's uh, setting the stage for a lot of this very riveting drama uh, that is about uh, these uh, relationships and the type of scandal and also a type of of betrayal and also a devotion to uh, filial devotion and also a type of emotional bonds in terms of, of love and passion and also uh, uh, betrayal and even, uh, yes, uh, shall we say it, uh, the stakes raised to life and death terms. And so uh, that is one aspect that I think drives the plot forward in a very compelling and yes, indeed, entertaining way. Now, that also uh, means, uh, that that does not mean that there uh, uh, the film uh, is only about that. In fact, uh, what I referred to earlier is that the film Prisioneros de la Tierra is a film that's strong, so strong because it, it uh, seems to embody so many elements. First being this uh, this wonderfully developed melodrama element uh, between and among these characters. And uh, that also <clears throat> provides, I think, uh, various uh, uh, parallel possibilities in terms of the presentation of what one might call uh, social realist themes, and this is derived from the uh, the depiction of the mensu, the treatment of the mensu, uh, and uh, in this particular area, uh, the uh, misiones area, uh, and how this is the backdrop for a story about uh, injustice and liberation, uh, authoritarianism, and the plight of the working class, and so, uh, and it's shot in a way, uh, in certain aspects of the film, it's shot in a way that could be said to have a very direct social realistic or realism aspect to uh, its shooting style and I think that has a lot to do with a lot of the uh, maybe political concerns of Mario Sofici and company as mentioned for instance uh, by uh, Matthew B. Kirsch in the essay which is uh, devoted to Prisoners de la Tierra and we'll get to this uh, discussion of the essay in a little bit later in this video. 
Uh, but that's uh, certainly there. So that's another aspect, which is a type of social political consideration uh, that is uh, set forth or expressed via the um, the backdrop or story of the mensu and the missionaries and the plight of the working class or the work or the workers or the contract workers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the authoritarian system as portrayed by or as personified or exemplified or represented by uh, the plantation owner side. And so, and the harsh circumstances, the the situations are very dire. And, and quite uh, quite deadly in a lot of places, and so uh, this gives rise to a type of, of hope for maybe a community or movement as represented by Podolé and company. So we shall see what happens. And so the the antagonism uh, between and among the characters is on the one hand very intimate and personal, based on this drama or melodrama component. It also has a social political aspect to it as well, thus leading to this aspect of social realism. So that parallel is very strong, and it, it's it's very striking. Um, perhaps embedded with that, or maybe one might say as a hybrid of the two, or perhaps yet another aspect of this film that can be said to be running parallel to these other current aspects, which is uh, uh, going to the style. There is a there is a sense in which this is showing a, a type of social political uh, commentary. But there's also a way in which the, the the film is having a bold directness as well, and that bold directness uh, is uh, I think showing. Uh, a type of maybe uh, the potential of cinema and also the the uh, the the um, uh, the raised stakes that can be portrayed through cinema. So on the one hand, there is a type of social realistic aspect to this film, which might be said to uh, be shown through quote unquote, uh, say quasi documentary types of feels uh, through some of the shots. And that's certainly there. But at the same time, there are aspects of the film that can be said to be very heightened beyond reality, transcending reality. And so uh, this is, for instance, portrayed by some of the performances, you know, some of the performances of the main actors, uh, again, to the great credit of the film and the great strength of the film, uh, they, some of the performances are maybe, uh, maybe subdued to preserve or to uh, enhance this aspect of the social realism, which is wonderful. And yet there are other aspects where there are other performances that really heighten reality that go uh, so, uh, that are very uh, stylized and uh, very much a part of a theatrical aspect, which is also very important too. And we see that this theatrical, uh, theatricality of some of the performances adds to a sense of, say, um, a reminder of the power of cinema. You know, we're not watching a documentary, we're watching a constructed story. And this constructed story has interwoven with it, within it themes and uh, ideas and a narrative structure or sense that is guided along by the flow of the character arcs of the various characters. So this is a constructed story. And in that way too, we as viewers are therefore uh, uh, enticed or we are uh, we are drawn in uh, by uh, these uh, aspects of theatricality when applied uh, in a skillful way, like they are by Mario Sofici and company here. They uh, are uh, contributing to great effect uh, for this film. So we have yet these uh, theatrical, uh, uh, cinematic, stylized aspects of these film, uh, of, of this film that sh that are shown through some of the performances, also through some of the choices as well. There is a bold starkness in terms of how this film figures into uh, showing. Uh, depicting certain scenes that I think for 1939 uh, were considered quite quite uh, graphic or quite bold or quite uh, innovative uh, uh, when one thinks about how, for instance, sexuality is portrayed uh, from the very opening of the film. I mean, this is something that uh, we understand was very, very novel and bold for 1939 standards. And so this, this is an example of where, where um, this film I think stands uh, so much uh, on its own merits, again, on a multitude of factors, uh, one of which being the role it has as a work of cinema and as a work of, of uh, theatricality and also as a work of, of uh, a type of a mission statement of the potential of, uh, of cinema during the 1930s and also a wonderful representation of uh, the cinema of Argentina, Argentine cinema. So uh, it is a... a uh, overall, it is a bold, dynamic, and fresh, and very entertaining work uh, that is that has elements of the tragic, that has elements of the hopeful, that has elements of, of the cultural, that has elements of the theatrical and melodramatic. And when you think about all those uh, 
uh, components combined together. The fact that it pulls uh, that balancing act off with such verve and flair and style and and uh, uh, success is a true testament to the power of this film. I mean, this is a really, really entertaining film, and it says so much, and it has a, a true uh, landmark uh, status about it. Uh, what a great film this is, and what a great miracle it is uh, for uh, the restoration to have occurred and for this film to have been rescued. And there will be some dis uh, discussions in some of the supplemental discussion areas where we can talk a little bit about this. So the story about the restoration is itself so fascinating and, and another cinema miracle. This is the work which is described once again from the year 1939. Uh, this is from the filmmaker Mario Sofici, and this is uh, Prisioneros de la Tierra. So the Criterion Collection has released this film, Prisioneros uh, de la Tierra, uh, as part of this World Cinema Project number four set. And again, it's at spine number 1144. Uh, the restoration is described in the latter part of this great booklet. And so let me read an excerpt from this with regard to this film. Uh, Prisioneros de la Tierra is presented in its original aspect ratio of 1.37 to 1. Uh, the digital transfer was created in 4K resolution uh, from the best elements available, uh, such as a 35 millimeter print uh, held in certain areas. Uh, so, uh, and the restoration uh, film was restored in 2018. Uh, and so, this is uh, this is, and there's also a mentioning of a 16 millimeter duplicate negative provided by a Museo del Cine Pablo Ducros Hicken in Buenos Aires. Uh, which we'll mention a little bit later because that's uh, very significant with one of the supplements uh, discussions. So uh, we understand that this restoration process is uh, is another great miracle. Uh, it is a, a a fascinating example of uh, what uh, what can be done. Uh, with the processes available uh, during this current age of uh, restoration, a sort of golden age of restoration in a manner of speaking. Uh, and also it preserves a type of legacy of the cinema, of Ar an Argentine cinema, uh, in a way that uh, is so wonderful and so glorious. And so the legacy of this film uh, and the discovery of this film uh, for uh, uh, new audiences, uh, myself included. Uh, this is uh, truly a, 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 a miracle indeed. So what a wonderful opportunity uh, for to be able to watch this film in this condition. It looks and sounds so crisp uh, and so wonderful indeed. So uh, well done indeed, well done indeed. And then with regard to the supplements that can be found linked to uh, the work Prisioneros de la Tierra, uh, let us talk about what's included on the disc. So first up is, as per usual with these uh, WCP releases, and they're great for this, uh, we have a brief Martin Scorsese introduction. This is described as being from 2022. This is approximately two minutes. And here Martin Scorsese mentions uh, certain aspects of the storytelling um, and uh, Kiroga and also the, the aspect of the mensu, this uh, sociocultural uh, component of the storytelling and Mario Sofici uh, and uh, certain aspects of uh, the biography or the filmmaking, uh, uh, or the filmography or the career of Sofici, as well as the context of this film uh, or the, the importance of this film in the context of uh, Argentine cinema. So. Uh, it's another great introduction. Again, I think one can watch it prior to seeing the film or maybe immediately after. Again, it's your choice. I don't think there are any details that emerge during Martin Scorsese's introduction that would say, uh, in my view, spoil the experience of watching the film itself. So it's a really lovely introduction. Again, uh, the uh, films included in all the WCP sets, uh, World Cinema Project sets, have this introduction and it really goes towards uh, a type of primer and also it uh, maybe is a an indication of particular points that one might be drawn to uh, when further exploring uh, the particular work. In this case, of course, Prisioneros de Tierra. So this is the Martin Scorsese introduction. This is approximately two minutes. It's really great. And that's not all because then we have another supplement which is called Restoring an Argentine Classic. And this is approximately 20 minutes. This is uh, from 2022. And this is with uh, Paula Felix Didier, and Andres Levinson, and uh, uh, they are described as your director and archivist of Museo de uh, Cine Pablo uh, Ducro Hiken. And here we have uh, a discussion of a number of aspects. So maybe if we were to think about this 
uh, from two fundamental points. One would be a c context of the discussion of the film and the background production, its context and its place in, uh, in Argentine cinema and indeed cinema writ large. And it really has a powerful a landmark status in that way and for for example people like myself for for me for instance in the position of not being in any way an expert when it comes to this film or indeed the cinema of, of uh, Ar uh, Argentine cinema uh, this type of explanation from uh, these two experts uh, is really uh, wonderful and we'll get to uh, some details of their discussion momentarily but that's one component fundamental component of this great supplement the other fundamental component one can say exists is their discussion of the restoration process and how this was essentially rescued and the sort of miracle that was involved in uh, discovering this so uh, we have uh, the um, uh, uh, you know, we have the, their uh, sort of discovery of the, of the good condition prints uh, quite recently, uh, which formed the basis of the restoration work. And so uh, there is a lot of, of uh, uh, luck and hard work, a, com a great combination, if I do say so myself. Uh, it's part of the story of the restoration process. So that's the second component of this great supplement. Again, approximately 20 minutes. So, um, so talking about, again, the context of the film itself, uh, these two uh, cinema experts, uh, talk about, for instance, Pampa film and Oregario uh, Ferrando and uh, this uh, sort of, uh, focus on during 1930s uh, Argentine cinema, uh, a an emphasis or an attempt at trying to create a certain type of style or need or marketplace uh, that would be in many ways a type of of maybe uh, uh, alternative, if you will, to uh, Hollywood cinema, right? And so this would be uh, the attempt of creating a type of national cinema, a non-Hollywood cinema, as it were, uh, using big budgets or, and, and also studio production values, etc. Uh, and so, and then also uh, paving the way for what one might call uh, uh, Argentine cinema. And indeed, uh, in that context, um, Prisoners uh, de Tierra is a very important film indeed, as these two uh, experts indicate. And so uh, the role of Pampa film in that way, also uh, the way in which Pampa film and uh, Ferrando were trying to uh, create a space for a sort of a creative freedom as well uh, as, as a type of uh, uh, individual streak. And I think that is uh, paving the way quite nicely for a filmmaker like uh, Sofici to uh, come in and, and uh, create the, the uh, masterwork that uh, Sofici created. So, uh, speaking of which, there is then detail about uh, the genesis of the production Prisioneros de la Tierra and of course uh, Quiroga, uh, Horacio Quiroga and the stories that were uh, the, the basis of the, uh, the screenplay. And uh, they describe um, uh, Quiroga's work as uh, if one uh, were to find or to attempt to find maybe an analogy, uh, say in uh, uh, cinema, uh, in uh, uh, um uh, say, uh, uh, American or European literature. Uh, they draw the uh, parallel to Edgar Allan Poe and short stories and the like. And so there's this idea of focusing on nature and also madness and death as well in those stories. And indeed, when one hears this description from these two experts, one can see that indeed these elements are embedded quite profoundly in the cinema viewing experience of uh, Prisioneros de la Tierra. So well done for being able to point this out. So this is a very illuminating part for me and also shows a type of not just the, uh, not just reminding us of the, of the social political importance of this film and what its context is, but also uh, how it's linked to a type of strong uh, literary tradition as well. Uh, and so this is very important indeed. And also the adaptation of these stories uh, by Dario um, uh, Quiroga and um, um, uh, Ulisse uh, Petit de Murat, etc., to bring this story to life for the uh, silver screen in, in a manner of speaking. So uh, there's also uh, the attempt at trying to uh, use locations, but also try to uh, bring in uh, popular film stars at the time. Uh, there's um, discussion about the possibility of, of uh, Jose Gola uh, being featured. And this is also mentioned a little bit in the essay, uh, Tropical Oppression, but uh, due to certain circumstances, which again, you can find discussed in the supplement and also in the essay, uh, that uh, was not, uh, that did not uh, come to fruition. But instead we have the cast as it is, and it's a really wonderful cast, uh, as they mentioned, uh, Petrone and Galbe and uh, Rao de Lange, et cetera, uh, portraying these roles. And, and as mentioned before, uh, they have their own 
own sort of style uh, to the performance. And so uh, sometimes it could be seen to be part of maybe a social political, uh, social realistic aspect, or it could be said to be part of a theatrical aspect as well, which heightens the drama, heightens the the melodrama to the point of, uh, of a type of uh, em emotional, uh, say, arc that uh, reaches a, a type of climax towards the uh, the final act of the film. So. There's also mentioning of language and how language and dialogue, dialect excuse me, is very important to show a type of divide between what one might say is the communal aspect of the, uh, the mensu. Uh, when they're together, they speak a certain dialect, which uh, might be differentiated from, uh, from uh, the, uh, the language dialect that is used, uh, for instance, with the, uh, the sort of the authoritarian presence of the plantation owner, etc. So uh, this is something that, again, is, it escapes my own ear because I am not fluent at all in the languages. So uh, this type of, of uh, it also links to a sense of a, of a further, say, separation or divide that is also inherent to uh, the social, political, and cultural context as provided by the story itself. You know, the plantation, the cultivation of the land, this type of industry, etc. So uh, this is very important stuff indeed. So uh, this component is very, very, uh, um, uh, very illuminating and wonderful and uh, such a learning... I, it, it felt like a lovely, a lovely, uh, uh, a lovely casual, say, uh, a lecture on the film, but uh, a lecture in the best sense of that term. It, it was a wonderful uh, uh, teaching. It, I felt like I was learning something new with every sentence that was being spoken here, and it just added more dimension to uh, to the enjoyment that I felt when watching uh, and the appreciation that I could uh, hope to have when watching uh, this were Prisioneros de la Tierra. So uh, this is such a valuable. Uh, supplement in my view. So well done for being able to include this. And of course, the second component one can say is their uh, their journey with respect to the discovery of, of high quality prints that could again form the basis of a restoration and what happened prior to that, how the film uh, materials were available in relatively speaking, maybe not so good condition. But then with this type of discovery miracle, uh, the restoration process was underway and thus it became a discovery process for people who may have understood or known the film in previous incarnations of releases, but now we have it in a new light, as it were. So again, another example of the miracle that is the restoration as part of the World Cinema Project uh, uh, efforts and endeavors. So, uh, this is really great indeed. So uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, supplement. And so please check it out if you can. Again, it's called Restoring an Argentine Classic, uh, approximately 20 minutes. And then I'd like to focus in uh, in sort of this final part of this discussion on the essay. And the essay I might have mentioned earlier is found in this really great robust book, which is part of the set overall, the WCP World Cinema Project number four set overall. And the essay on uh, Prisioneros de la Tierra begins on page 20. And this is by Matthew B. Karush. And I think this is another great one. Uh, it talks about the uh, career trajectory of uh, Sofici. It also talks about the importance of Quiroga and the stories that form the basis of the adaptation, uh, including, of course, uh, by uh, Dario Quiroga, the, the, the son of the author, etc., and as well as the specific components that uh, one can say are being balanced all at once when watching this film, the social realism elements, the theatrical elements, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the melodrama elements, and uh, they all work towards the same goal or the same motivation, which is to form the basis of this uh, cinematic whole that is Prisioneros de la Tierra. And also there is discussion of some of the production details of certain casting possibilities that ended up not occurring because of, say, location, logistic uh, situations, uh, and then casting decisions were made based on that, uh, and also the importance of Sofici, the trajectory of Sofici, maybe a type of, of a political um, driver motivation with respect to uh, his work here and in other parts of his filmography as well as the uh, way in which this film figures in as a type of, of landmark of, uh, of, the, of Argentine cinema, as has been uh, mentioned so many times uh, with, uh, with great reason, because it truly is. So, uh, and you have an essay like this, Tropical Oppression, uh, to remind us of this in, in wonderfully uh, well-worded uh, prose. So uh, this is a really great, great essay, another great one. Uh, the, these World Cinema Project sets are, are brilliant, and this number four set is, is a great, great uh, continuation continuation of that brilliance and uh, you see that in all parts of this release including the essay so please check this out if you can it's really worth it again watch the film first 
And then uh, my recommendations after you see the film, then you can enjoy this great essay. Again, it's called Tropical Oppression. And so with that, my friends, this is a brief uh, discussion on this great film, uh, Prisoners de la Tierra, uh, Prisoners of the Earth from 1939, which can be found again at spine number 1144 as part of this great set, Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Project number four. All right, my dear friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great, great movies. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. I very, very much appreciate it. Stay strong, stay safe, and cheers. Mm -hmm.